where you are. Why can't this couple help themselves? Plus, follow what I say to the T. A woman abused by her husband. You have a stupid ass nerve about your stupid ass self. The physical pain almost unbearable. He had literally, physically, and mentally beat me down to nothing. I thought I was not as good as a piece of dirt on his shoe. But the pain of who was videotaping it, even worse. Haunting words. Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. Sometimes it seems in our digital age that there isn't much that is still private. But you probably have never seen anything quite like these two stories, captured on tape while they were happening. First, a young woman in college with everything to live for, including a devoted boyfriend. And then one snowy night, it all went wrong. Cynthia McFadden first brought us this story in 2005 about making all the wrong moves and a desperate race against time. January 4, 2005. A storm is approaching east of Nebraska. Out in the storm, trying to get home, a young couple. 20-year-old Janelle Hornicle, a college junior, a sorority girl, and her boyfriend, Michael Walmsley. They have known each other since the seventh grade. By 7.30 that night, the blinding snowstorm is making driving treacherous. Police in the small town of Geneva pull over Janelle's black pickup. Michael is driving. They're stopped for failing to signal. This is the actual video from the police dashboard camera. Michael tells the officer they're lost, looking for Pacific Street. Pacific in Geneva, Omaha. Omaha. They're trying to get home to their apartment in Omaha, but home is 120 miles away in the raging blizzard. The officer gives them a warning ticket and directions back to the highway. Turn left. The first of a series of missed opportunities to avert the crisis that lies ahead. The next time authorities will hear from the couple is five hours later. The pickup is spun off the road. Janelle makes a desperate, frightened call to 911. It is half past midnight. Mark Conray is director of Omaha's 911 center. When the first call came in, it made no sense. It made absolutely no sense. Gibberish, nonsense is what she was describing. 911, what's your emergency? Hi, I'm Mexicans and African Americans, and they're all dressed up in like these cold outfits, and they're moving all the vehicles. Do I just keep driving back and forth until I can get out, or I don't? Why won't they let us out? And they're taking the cars apart and putting them in the trees. Yes. Unless the owner is there moving their car for them. What was going on? Had the couple had an accident, been injured? Were they disoriented? Could this be a prank? Oh, yeah, I think I'm gonna have to start running and get out of the vehicle. I don't know where else to go. The police are on the way. Okay, thank you. They say they're at their apartment at 75th and Poppleton in Omaha. But 911 operators know the cell phone signal is coming from neighboring Sarpy County, not Omaha. As this satellite image shows, the couple's apartment is near downtown. But Michael and Janelle are actually 23 miles away in a desolate and remote area where their truck went off the road. Soon, the couple makes another tragic mistake. They leave the truck behind, which still has a half a tank of gas, warm clothes, and his cell phone in the back seat. The temperature is 13 degrees and dropping. 1.05 a.m. 30 minutes after the first call. This time, Michael makes the call. Where are you? It's an old abandoned pond, like lake, front area where they have cattle and an old, like, gravel pump set up. And we need some assistance, like, right now. Okay, I can't help you if I don't know where you are. Yeah, no, I'm not lying to you. Sir, I don't think that you're lying to me, but we're going to need to do more work on where you are because we've been to 75th and Poppleton, and we cannot find you. Okay? Because they need to come further south. Further south. Open the gates. The gates to what? There's no gate at 75th and Poppleton. There's apartments. There's, there was nothing that... Nothing that made sense. Michael and Janelle aren't making sense. They're hallucinating, paranoid, and confused. The former high school cheerleader, the star student, and the boy of her dreams are high on crystal meth. 
investigators believe she for the first time. Omaha dispatchers send another police unit to the couple's apartment, and of course, they find nothing. Ma'am, my pickup was stolen. I had to go find it. <sighs> Please help me. My girlfriend is really freezing. This is not a hallucination. If rescuers can't find them soon, they will both freeze to death. Janelle has only jeans and a sweater. Neither is wearing a coat. When the 911 call abruptly ends, the concerned operator tries to call back Janelle's cell phone, but only gets her voicemail. Hi, this is Janelle. Can you a message? We have to keep trying. Um, we don't have any other choice. Hi, this is the haunting, happy voice of Janelle. Please a message. By this time, several operators in three counties are trying to figure out where the couple might actually be. So I'm just going to share. Hi, have you talked to a Michael tonight at all that doesn't know where he's at? Half a dozen units are already out searching. Patty Viberg is one of the 911 dispatchers. We guessed pretty much it was they were probably on drugs, but we were not going to assume that. You know, it was still the possibility of this head injury, still the possibility of hypothermia, even if they were on drugs. They needed help. But Nebraska does not have the most up-to-date 911 GPS tracking system for cell phones, so operators cannot pinpoint their location. 1.45 a.m. It has been an hour and 15 minutes since the first call. Where are you Please. at? Someone out in by the lake. First, when I talked to him, I wanted him to get back to the car. At least that was shelter. It's odd to vote over on his top. Oh, it's on his top. Yes, okay. I need help. Then he said, well, no, the car's on its top. And I said, well, that's not a good idea. It could be leaking gasoline. You know, it might not be a safe place for them to go back to. But the truck isn't on its top. It's just off the road. Mike, you've got to help me help you, okay? I know, I'm trying. But... Okay, so, so we got to just kind of take a deep breath and let's figure out where you're at, okay? Michael describes seeing these cranes, scrap metal, a lake, a sand pit, but also keeps insisting he's near his apartment. Go straight north. Just please hurry. Okay, we're hurrying. We're getting there as fast as we can. We don't know where you're at. Is that your girlfriend? Yeah. Let me talk to her, okay? I asked him to give the phone to Janelle because he wasn't making any sense. Hello? Hi, do you have any idea where you're at? Can I talk to our phone call first? Oh, no. Investigators say they could be anywhere in a hundred square mile radius. And Patty Viberg knows there is little time left. I knew I wasn't going to get anywhere with Janelle because she was, she was, not coherent at that time. There's people in the shack that are flashing the light on top of the shack. Oh, there's people on the shack? Yes. Go, go talk to them. Go to the people they in the don't. shack. We tried. <laughs> they won't talk. We tried to ask for help. We begged. Okay, tell them, that the, tell them that the police are on the phone and hand them your phone. Okay? I had them call out to them. Still optimism. Hopefully, maybe there was somebody there, you know. Never second guess. Please, anyone, help me. Come on. It's too cold. Are they responding to you? No. Okay. I don't think they speak English. I don't know any other languages. It felt to me like we were getting somewhere, and then he'd back up into hallucinations again. And Janelle is getting worse. Oh. Honey, come on, get up. <laughs> is she starting to lay down? Yes. Breathing, please. You can While driving through a raging Nebraska blizzard, a young woman and her boyfriend have spun off the road and made a terrible mistake. They've left their warm car and outdoor clothing. Now they're trying to find their way home on foot, and the temperature is dropping fast. Once again, Cynthia McFadden. 20-year-old Janelle Hornicle and her boyfriend Michael Walmsley are lost in a snowstorm. They've been wandering two hours in the frigid cold, minus 10 degrees with the wind chill, calling 911 for help. Term 75th to West Center Road, and on that's that area. Mike, Mike. No, that's the best I can give you. That's all I've got. But I'm freezing. And my girlfriend's here freezing. And I don't know where you're at. That's why we want to help you, Mike. Okay. 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 Okay.
I gotta get him to quit crying. I've gotta get him to help me help him. And he just couldn't. Couldn't because they are high on crystal meth and hallucinating. How did this happen? Where did they get the drug? And who are these young people now in danger of freezing to death? In some ways, Janelle Hornicle is the last person you'd expect to use crystal meth. Yeah, yeah. she did everything possible. <laughs> she was in sororities, she was in a fraternity, she worked full time. Danielle Schutz, Julie Prentice, and Jennifer Hofferber were Janelle's roommates at Creighton University. They agreed on almost everything, except how to set the thermometer. She hated the cold. She would always turn up the heater. We, yeah, we had heater wars. Point. Yeah, because we'd always turn it down, and she'd wait till we went to sleep and crank it up because <laughs> she hated being cold. Creighton was a long way from the family farm in rural Ord, Nebraska, where Janelle was the youngest of four children. In high school, she was an honor student and athlete. In the drama club, sang in the choir, and was a cheerleader. Janelle seemed to have it all, including a devoted boyfriend, Michael Walmsley. He was great. They were always together. Janelle would get up at 5 in the morning every morning to talk to him on the phone before he went to work. And yeah, was he was the last person she talked to at night. Janelle and Michael moved in together to that apartment in Omaha at 75th and Poppleton. I think Janelle was his first love, to tell the truth. Chris Walmsley is Michael's older brother. She was his own personal little princess. He was going to give her the life that he thought she deserved. Janelle's sisters, Jan and Kathy, brother Steve, and parents, Twyla and Kent, liked Mike too. He was very polite, very quiet. Quiet. Uh -huh. Very scared of us. <laughs> <laughs> he was going to support her, or try to, till she got through college. And then she was going to support him so he could go back to school, which, you know, can't can fault that. But there was something they didn't know, something Michael's brother suspected, that Michael was using drugs and even confronted him about using crystal meth. I told him, I go, whatever you're on, Michael, think about it in the long run. And this is about Thanksgiving sometime in there. I go, it, it's time to stop. We're old enough, the kid steps over. He agreed with me. We've talked to, to Mike's brother, who has said that he was concerned that Mike was using drugs. No, she always said that Mike didn't drink and Mike didn't do drugs like some others. I've talked to the brother several times and he's never mentioned that to me. So I didn't know it either. Maybe trying to protect you. Janelle's mother says she can't imagine that her daughter was taking crystal meth. In fact, she took these pictures of Janelle early on New Year's Eve, just a few days before she got lost. There was no signs of anything. They had normal sleep patterns. They played games with the kids, board games with the kids. There was nothing. They were so happy, nothing wrong that we knew of. It's later that very night that things went terribly wrong. Uh, we believe they proceeded down this road. Sarpy County there. Captain Raleigh Yost led the investigation into Janelle and Michael's disappearance. We went back and retraced uh, their steps uh, from New Year's Eve. Uh, we know where they were. We know parties they were at. There was drugs at those party locations. And Captain Yost says it is possible that night was the first time Janelle had ever tried crystal meth. We have talked to a lot of uh, acquaintances of hers. No one had said anything about meth in, the, in her background. January 4th, Janelle and Michael are on their way back to Omaha. Still high, police believe, heading into that storm. That routine traffic stop now seen more clearly in hindsight. We believe both of them were awake for several days prior to that, which is another thing that meth does to you. Uh, it doesn't let you sleep. It would be five hours later that their truck goes off the road and they go wandering into the storm, dialing 911. At about 2 a.m., the lost couple stumble upon a small shack. I want you to stay in that booth. Whatever you do, you're going to stay in that booth. Yeah, I need for you to be honest with me, Mike, okay? Yes. Yeah. I need for you to be honest. Yeah. Have you done any kind of drugs tonight? No, I haven't done it, no drugs. We can't prove it if you have. I don't. But it would help me to know if you did. 
I don't do this now. I just, I really don't. But she knows he's been hallucinating. Oh, so how okay. come all these 200 people that you see can't, you, they can't help you? Ma'am, I don't think they speak English. They what? <sighs> Was it so strongly controlling him that he couldn't be honest with me? You know, it wasn't Michael. It was the drug. Then, almost two hours after first calling 911, Michael says he and Janelle are leaving the shelter of the shack. Again, the call ends abruptly. Another 911 operator tracks down Janelle's mother. They called me at 2.30 in the morning when she was lost because I owned her cell phone. Well, we don't know exactly where they're at is the problem. <sighs> no. They lived in Omaha. It was, you know, why, what is she doing out in a snowstorm like this? You know, she knows better than that. And I kept saying, oh, I don't know whether to kick her or hug her when we find her. How alarmed were you by this phone call? Did, did you think, well, this is just a misunderstanding? I figured they'd stay in the pickup and that they was just lost. <laughs> they wanted to know if they might be on drugs. And we said, no, no. way that we know of. Just no way. <laughs> and I guess we were wrong. Janelle and Michael have been out in below freezing temperatures for almost four hours now. The two are young and healthy. Janelle, an athlete. Mike works outside as a landscaper. But how much longer can they survive? When we come back, while authorities desperately search, Michael and Janelle try to find their way back to the truck. I have just escaped. Please come get us. We're trying to find you. You're out walking again? Stay with us. Nebraska authorities are locked in a race against time to find a young couple lost in a blizzard and high on crystal meth. As Cynthia McFadden reports, Michael and Janelle's desperate calls to 911 are about to come to an abrupt end. The last call comes in at 4.20 a.m. The call is short, less than two minutes. There will be no more calls to 911. More than 12 hours after that first call came in, Sarpy County deputies finally locate their truck. Volunteers comb the area. The ground is now covered with more than a foot of snow. Well, she's a hometown girl. She's going to school down here at Omaha. But uh, there's a lot of people. It's a close-knit group out in the valley. And uh, you just want to uh, find her and, and uh, bring her home. I knew it was really cold, big snowstorm. It's been a long time to be in that much cold. Michael's body was found the next day. It took six difficult and heartbreaking days to find Janelle. I called mom and said, we have her. We found her. The couple who in life were inseparable died alone and apart. She was located at the base of this cliff. Uh, it's quite possible that she was walking south along the edge as they were walking, not knowing what was here. She come off this cliff. With the crime scene tape represents where we located her body. Michael Walmsley walked on, making that last call to 911, then collapsing about a half mile down this road. And one final mystery. Who were those people Michael says wouldn't help them? who didn't speak English. Captain Yost has a theory. It's quite possible that he sees the cattle 
uh, hears the breathing of the cattle and, and he thinks maybe these are people and these people aren't helping him. He could be calling out for help and they're not responding. It, it, it's a guess. And both Michael and Janelle had frozen to death and both tested positive for crystal meth methamphetamine at levels that indicate they had taken the drug some two to three days earlier. How do you feel about Michael now? Do you feel that Michael was in some way leading her in this path? Do you feel this was somehow his fault? To our knowledge, no. He respected her. He was always kind to her. I don't know what happened. I can't condemn him. We have nothing to prove of anything, so we'd like to keep it <laughs> that way. You know, I mean, if we don't find anything, I think he was a nice kid. Gabby Zybert, Michael's mother, has a faded picture of Janelle from his wallet and a box containing the clothes he left behind in the truck the night he walked into the storm. They lived for each other. They did. She wouldn't leave him behind, and he wouldn't leave her behind. That's, that's how they were. It's like you know, Romeo and Juliet, I mean. It was really a romance story, I think. You know, they loved each other very much. It's not supposed to happen this way. It's supposed to be the kids supposed to bury their parents and not the other way around. He loved you, didn't he? Mm -hmm. I have a lot of unanswered questions that I want to get answered. I'm trying to look cool with her a little bit. I'll never have them answered until I see him again. Meth and drugs wasn't Janelle's life. That wasn't her whole life. If we can save one family from going through what we went through, it's worth it. Operators had so much trouble locating Michael and Janelle because in 2005, Nebraska was one of nine states without the most up-to-date tracking system for mobile phones. Like most areas of the country, Sarpy County, where Janelle and Michael were lost, has since updated their system. When we come back, domestic abuse caught on tape. Follow what I say to the teeth. And the shocking truth of who was forced to record it when we return. Now we bring you a story of a wife who was physically and mentally abused by her husband. What makes this case so disturbing is that the abuse was actually videotaped and the husband was not the only family member involved. As Diane Sawyer reported in 2006, in the end, it was the video that would set Susan free. In a nice neighborhood in upstate New York, in a nice house like the ones you know, behind closed doors, a father commands his 13-year-old son to pick up a camera and start recording. Look at me. You play those stupid games with me, I'll knock your teeth out of your face. The father delivers a verbal flogging to the mother in front of their children. You act like a in front of the kids. It will go on for nearly an hour. You little slut. If I see a dog chewing your ass up, I won't stop. I won't stop. It is domestic abuse, the kind we hear about but often don't believe. Susan is 42 years old. They have three children. The father, Ulner, directs his 13-year-old son, the cameraman, to get a close-up of their emotionally battered mother. Zoom in. Do you see a tear? He indicates he wants the tape to prove that his anger at his wife is justified. What prompts his tirade? Susan asks him if he'd like some lunch. Just come over here with this stupid Yeah. And stir it up. No, you didn't leave. You didn't just come ask me about lunch. He even makes his 13-year-old son join him in blaming her. And if you're wondering what kind of woman would endure something like this if you're certain she's nothing like you, well, take a look at Susan on tape three years ago and look at the woman she really is today. What do you see when you look at her? A woman desperate, desperately trying to save whatever she can salvage of her family. Desperately trying to please her husband and do whatever it is 
that he wants her to do. For Susan, the story begins when she is 18 years old, the daughter of a black father, a white mother, who falls in love with a 26-year-old guitarist in a popular local band. He is talented, charismatic. His name is Ulner. I would go to see him play on the weekends, and we'd talk on the phone, and we just sort of grew to know each other. Did you say to yourself, I'm happy? Absolutely. They got married. He worked as a musician, she with a health insurance company, and they had their three children. We're covering their faces at her request. Everyone looks at you, and I know the first thing they would think is, so beautiful, so oh, intelligent. You. you must have been able to take care of yourself in any situation. I was, I was shy. I was very green. You know, my world was absolutely inside of the walls of our home. She says at first her husband was just very demanding and controlling, not so different from her own father, whom she described as overbearing. But she says the more she tried to comply with her husband's demands, the more obsessive his control. Did you have friends over for dinner? Never, never. He never wanted friends over. He never wanted men in his house in particular. And your father and stepfather didn't know about this? My um, husband had cut me off from my father and family um, for many years. How are you going to say something I'm stupid like that? Like and you can hear on the videotape how his badgering, his criticism wore her down by twisting her words. When I was watching my son do something, and he said, don't look at him like you're interested in what he's doing. And I said, I think I am interested in what my children do. I think I'm interested in my children. And he turned that into, I think I'm interested in what my children do. So you can think you care about your children, whatever you want to think you care about. You don't. And then he turned it into, I think I love my children. All in the same conversation. That phrase turned into something totally different. Stupid ass heifer. In that 51 minute tape, Ulner calls Susan stupid 36 times. And just you standing there talking stupid like that pisses me off. Because she should be on your knees apologizing to you stupid ass heifer. The rant. Yes. The, the mental and verbal abuse. Just hours. I mean, he would call it a family meeting. And these family meetings were all about what mommy did wrong today. He totally had my children completely on his side, completely brainwashed. Not only could I not believe his behavior, but I couldn't believe my own children's behavior. She says the verbal abuse had gone on for years before the words became fists. She says the first time he hit her, it was because she forgot something he wanted at a nearby grocery store. Her oldest child, her daughter, was 19. He beat me down to the floor. I was crawling on the floor trying to get away. I remember my daughter turning on the vacuum cleaner so that my younger children couldn't hear it. You know more what's going on at work than in your own house. At the time of the tape, she was working, he was not. He was jealous of men on the outside. And this got to do with somebody at work. It does Heffa. not. I don't have anyone. Half a line in. I can't tell you how many baseball coaches I was accused of, swimming teachers, um, karate teacher, other parents, anything. Video this lying ass up. But her greatest agony was the role of her children. When you think your son was on the other side of that lens. Not only that, my younger son was right there also. He was in the room. Their youngest son, eight years old. Toward the end of the tape, Ulner explodes in violence. You were sorry you wouldn't come up here. You wouldn't do that. You know you would have left if you came up here. Ask me that again. You don't know what to do. Look at your stupid ass. Look at the way you look. At one point, for that. nearly three minutes, the son seems unable to record what the father is doing. He keeps the lens facing away toward his own feet. You follow what I say to the T. The terrified mother, Susan, covers her face while the father, Ulner, strangles her, throws her to the floor. You have a stupid ass nerve about your stupid ass self. And you don't learn after I beat your hands all the time. You do not learn. When you look back, are you amazed you didn't crack in some other way? Absolutely. The only thing that kept me from cracking was the thought of my children. And impossible as it is to believe, as this was going on, she still managed to care for the children, the house, and work at a part-time job. 
Her boss was Lynn Jasper, who started picking up on something unsettling, the way she heard Susan talk to her husband on the phone at the end of the day. I'm calling you now to tell you that I'm leaving so you can clock the time that it takes me to get home. And if I vary from that course, what punishment am I going to have to suffer when I get there? And a phrase Susan uses on the phone horrifies Lynn. And when I called, I had to call him master. Yes, master. No, master. And you hear it the first couple times and you think, wow, what a sick individual. You're going to work and functioning in the workplace and then coming back to this prison. Yes. I think that any... Any independent, strong-willed woman would be quick to say, and I'll admit I was one of them, why doesn't she just leave? Why, why would you take that? Again, it's the question everyone asks and cannot, cannot understand people. And I know what that question is. Why didn't you just leave? Why didn't you leave? A lot of it is preservation of family. I didn't want to see my family destroyed. And in my eyes, because of what he was telling me, I was the problem. So all I had to do was fix me. On average, it will take seven tries for a woman to leave her abuser. The psychological chains as strong as any metal. He had literally physically and mentally beat me down to nothing. I thought I was not as good as a piece of dirt on his shoe. When we come back, the abuse, as bad as it is, reaches a new level. You do think he would have killed you? I know. Oh. And Susan reaches her breaking point. I said, today's the day. Stay with us. Forty-two-year-old Susan has been suffering beatings at the hands of her husband, and it's all been recorded on video by their 13-year-old son. Susan thinks no one outside the family knows, but she will soon be proved wrong. Her co-worker, Lynn, is watching. Once again, Diane Sawyer. May 6, 2003, back at the office, Lynn notices that Susan has a wound on her head. I asked her, I said, mm -hmm. what happened to your head? And I said, oh, I was pulling a box off the shelf in the closet and the corner of the box fell and hit me in the eye. But Lynn makes note of the day on her calendar and she continues to take notes for herself when she sees something worrying. On May 20th, 2003, Lynn notices that Susan arrives late to work. She tucked her hair behind her ear and her whole ear was bruised. And then it occurred to me that, dear God, she, it's not that she's ignoring me. She probably can't hear me. Her husband had ruptured her eardrum with the back of his hand. It seems she had broken one of her husband's new rules, forbidding her to hug and kiss her own children. Just three days later, another set of bruises, including on the face and back of her hands, recorded by Lynn in her calendar. I came in very, very upset. I couldn't couldn't contain it. She started to cry, and we had gone into a room privately, and I'd closed the blinds. And she said, okay, Susan, what's going on? And I need you to know that I'm here for you. She told me a lot of what was going on, but you know what? Not even close to the whole story. And then I begged her not to tell anyone. Begged her because I didn't want my husband to get in trouble. So much was happening inside that house. He had kicked her with his sneakers, beat her with a hardcover book, struck her repeatedly with a belt. And finally, Susan became so terrified, she slipped a letter into Lynn's desk drawer. I opened one of the lower drawers of my desk, and there was an envelope in there. It had my name on it. And I remember reading it and just getting physically just sick, like, to the point where I actually it actually made me throw up. The letter was for her children in case she died. The letter that Susan wrote to her boys was just her whole heart on a piece of paper. And there was no mistaking the fact that she knew that he was not at all beyond killing her. You do think he would have killed you? I know oh. he would have. I know he would have. Then, a month later, the videotaped episode of June 22nd that changed everything for Susan. Get your ass off that floor and sit up, stand up. And when I looked in his eyes, 
my husband wasn't there anymore. His eyes were empty. And you gonna sit up there and tell me you don't know what to do? No, wait a minute, you gonna tell me? For what would be her long final night at home, Susan planned her escape. I got up and piled on makeup, hoping that he wouldn't look at me too hard because my face was very battered. And I dropped my um, older son off at school and I went to work. When Susan walked in on the last day, she was beaten and marked worse than I had seen. And I remember saying to her, it's got to stop. It has to, it ends here. I looked at her and I said, today's the day. Once I said to Lynn, that was it. She said, okay, I'm calling and went and did it immediately. With the help of police over the next few hours, she ran a heart pounding race against the clock. And I knew that my husband was gonna be looking for me. First, she raced to pick up her youngest son at elementary school and took him to the police station. The police picked up her older boy. But Susan's phone had been ringing and ringing. Officer Kathy Onions. We decided to have Susan call the residents and speak to her husband to reassure him that uh, she picked up the son as she was instructed to. We wanted to document what his response was to this conversation and, uh, you know, and have it on a tape. Hello, honey. Where are you? I'm afraid to come home. I'm afraid to come home. You stupid ass heifer. What do you mean, what you mean you're afraid to come home? You better bring my son home. If you don't bring my son home, I'm gonna kill you, heifer. I don't want you to hurt me. What I'm are afraid you? to come home. At another point, Ulner talked directly to Officer Onions. He told me that uh, he controls them, that he tells them what to do, they're his property, and he can tell me to release them. And I explained to him that that's not how it works. Get your ass off that floor and sit up, stand up. But domestic abuse cases are notoriously difficult. It would be his word against hers. And what would the children say, including her daughter, who wanted to stay with her dad? The question loomed, would Ulner be free to come after Susan again? But a week after Susan's escape, when police officers were interviewing her, she casually dropped a bombshell. Again, Officer Kathy Onions and Officer Cindy Herberger. Excuse me, did you see a videotape? And she goes, oh yes, um, my older son was made to videotape this whole assault. I said, you've gotta be kidding me. And I just looked over at Kathy and my eyes went big and her eyes went big at me. But if you think having that video alone would seal an abuser's fate, you are wrong. What would he be convicted of if there were only that tape? Class A misdemeanor. That's all. Maximum jail time one year, which in reality is nine months. This is inconceivable. When you see it and you say, that's all the law considers this to be a misdemeanor? You don't have serious physical injury. She has bruises, she has bumps. So based on the tape alone, Ulner could have been out in less than a year. John O'Donnell was presiding judge in the case. He continued to say that, that uh, they were the Cosby family. When the prosecution offered Ulner a deal of four years to protect the children from a trial? He absolutely rejected that sentence in a heartbeat. Prosecutor Lisa Rodwin. And he said, no one will believe her. The children won't testify against me. I will win. What Ulner apparently did not realize was that his wife had that guardian angel with a calendar. In the end, those notes would help prosecutors charge him with 12 separate vicious assaults against his wife. This was a vital piece of physical evidence for the jury to see that somebody else could verify what happened, that she was hurt, that she saw bruises, and these are the dates. Susan's children are called to testify. Her eldest son is still a reluctant witness, but he does tell the jury that his father whipped his mother with a belt and the younger son, the little one. For him to talk about dad hitting mom was emotionally wrenching. He started sobbing uncontrollably on the stand. But the eldest, the daughter, will stand by her father and testify that she never witnessed a single incident of abuse. In the end, Ulner is found guilty on all counts. The judge, who will never forget that searing tape, hands down a sentence of 36 years the videotape is it's terrible and as you can see it's still still gets to me people say you get murder convictions that don't have that kind of sentence 
what the judge said at sentencing was, you have destroyed this family as much, if not more, than if you had committed a murder. To see somebody that you once loved go to prison for 36 years, even after everything he did to me, it wasn't something that made me happy. Susan and her children are still trying to regain their lives. The youngest doing well. The oldest child, her daughter, who spent the most years under illness control, is having the toughest time. Are you estranged from her now? She's okay. She's um, working very hard at being okay. And what about the son who made that videotape? He and his mother are together. Does your older son understand how he was used and manipulated now? Yes, he does. No forgiveness is needed. Oh, absolutely. From the start, my children knew that. You know, I could never hold them responsible for what happened there. And her son's tape has now become a potent weapon against abuse. Susan now uses it at police academies to put a personal face on an epidemic. Remember that if you go to somebody's door, that woman's gonna tell you, no officer, no problem. She'll hug her.